Okay, welcome to Parent Conversations. We are continuing our digital wellness series this week. And the topic today is protecting physical health in the digital world. I was just commenting to somebody the other day um, about the last two weeks that we've discussed um, wellness, digital wellness, and, and how it's just so intertwined with physical and mental. I mean, it, it's, it, there's nothing necessarily new that we're, that we're being, that we're learning. It's just the, the concept that digital wellness is so tied to our physical and mental and emotional wellness is just kind of a, a new thing. Um, got a lot of information. I'm going to turn the time over to Michelle. If you have questions, feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat. Um, this is meant to be an informal conversation. We're just engaging with each other. It's not a, it's not a speech. So absolutely throw in your two cents worth and Michelle, go ahead and take it away. Okay. I'm just going to go right to my screen share here. As thanks for the perfect intro um, of how this is all, all connected and intertwined. Last week we talked about mental wellness. This week we'll talk about physical wellness, but they are not separate topics. They really do overlap and intersect. Um, just a reminder that these discussions are for educational purposes only. You know, that disclaimer that you hear out there um, as we talk, especially as we talk about mental and physical wellness. Um, please be sure to seek any professional help that you feel that you need in any of these ways. We're here just to have some discussions and share some ideas, as Megan said. Today's outline, we will um, do a brief check-in like we've done in weeks past and that we will continue to do during the course of this series. We'll talk about, we'll discuss together actually digital impacts on our physical, our relationship with our physical space and environment, befriending our body's stress response. So last week we talked a little bit about um, the mental health side of our, of emotions like stress, but stress also is a very physical and everything we experience emotionally has a physical side. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about befriending our physical stress response. Um, we'll review the physical health survey question section of the, the survey from the Digital Wellness Institute. Um, and the way we're going to do that this week is to actually just get into the questions with some, some data and recommendations. And a couple of other tips and tricks for better better for better physical self-care in a digital world. And then we'll invite you to reflect and um, consider invitations and actions for the next week. As a review, um, we, are, we are on week three. For the first week we covered, start with your center. Last week we covered mental wellness. This week we cover physical wellness. And then you can see, if you can see the screen, topics for the coming weeks. Um, and you can also see that in our model. Um, and just as a reminder, we have media literacy folded throughout this model. And, and part of media literacy is understanding kind of the degree of detail you're getting and resources and references. We're, we're giving you just an overview. Um, we'll be sending out a more detailed this week. We're sending out a more detailed slide deck. So what you're seeing here is a simplified slide deck we'll send out a slide deck that has a little more research um, for you to consider that we find exciting and helpful. And we'll also be providing some more detailed materials for all the topics at the end of the series. When we were uh, trained in digital wellness, we were trained on, a, on an eight pronged wheel by the Digital Wellness Institute. There were two, we're using a six pronged wheel that matches the Digital Wellness Institute survey that I've mentioned. Um, and today it just felt like it would be good to let you know what we won't be covering um, in this series, which is using technology or data as part of a pursuit of physical health. This is sometimes called the quantified self um, with wearable health devices or other things like that. Uh, but if you are interested in talking more about that, please let me know. All right. 
check-in. This is your, your own personal check-in to write down or think about three words that describe how you are feeling at the moment. Why do we do this? Because the concept of awareness, self-awareness is so key to digital wellness that the more aware we are, the more armed we are to make deliberate choices. Um, how we're feeling physically, mentally, spiritually, socially, any, any of these ways can impact how we use technology. So I'll just give you a few seconds to think about that. Again, if you're not sitting and just kind of listening to the background, instead of writing, you can just think, what are, how am I doing today? And this is the kind of thing we can do, do any time during the day to just do a little, hmm, how is my internal weather? How is my body feeling? How, how, are, how is my mind feeling, my brain feeling today? If we had more time, we'd actually go around the Zoom and have everybody share. Um, at least one just to get us started, but we'll just let that be a self-reflection question. Um, the second part of the check-in is reviewing last week's invitations. Uh, we invited and continue to invite you to take the digital wellness survey if you have not. That link is shared out every week um, from Megan and Shirley. And to try one new mental wellness practice, to review the slides that we went through last week and try just one, just something simple and or to share and discuss one building brain awareness activity from last week. So I wanted to put that out there to any of you, one or, if one or two of you would, would like to share how your experience with any of these things was last week. Um, I'll share one, Michelle. Thanks, John. This is, this is kind of um, embarrassing, but it was kind of interesting too. Uh, my husband and I were watching conference and I took both of our telephones and I took them to a different room. <laughs> we were watching it on my computer and taking notes. And so um, I felt kind of bad that I just coerced his phone away from him, <laughs> but his notes were really good in that session. <laughs> And so are mine. And did he have anything to say about his experience? <laughs> no, I, I need to still talk to him about that because he, he's gone on a river rafting trip right now. So you did a little, a little experiment with the mere presence phenomenon to see yeah, what, what yeah, difference it would make. Yeah, presence, uh-huh, to get awesome. it out of there so he could really focus and not be multitasking. I've, it's made a difference for me. Anyone else? Thanks for sharing, Jen. And while we're here, we'll welcome Linda and Emily and Melissa. So glad you're here. All right, we'll move on to the next slide. So the first topic we'll discuss today, and this is just a, a discussion. Hey, um, Michelle. Yes, ma'am. There were just a couple of comments I thought worth reading. Emily oh, said, great. Thought, she said, I thought it was interesting how clingy I felt social media when Facebook went down yesterday. <laughs> oh, so other people, my, my daughter was talking about that. I didn't experience that. So yeah, yeah. apparently and then, it was a pretty big deal. Then Catherine said that she took the DWI survey. Well, good for you, Catherine. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. I am right now not able to see chat. So I am going to let you take that. That's fine. I don't know I can why it's not showing up on my screen share, but it is not. Thank you for, for manning that for us, for keeping tabs. And thanks to those who just shared. All right, as you think about, um, I realize that some of you may be listening and not seeing the screen. So those of you who can see the screen, we definitely need your help. We're gonna talk for a second about how, how digital devices impact our relationship to our physical space and environment. I've just created a little collage of examples. Um, but what do you see? First of all, what do you see on the screen? If you can see the screen and what might you add to the screen when you think about um, our relationship with our physical space? 
and how technology can impact it. Our physical space. Well, when when you say it like that, I think of I think of the whole um, technology, the, the the neck and shoulder problems. <laughs> So think the physical of, space within our bodies, right? Yes, yes. yes. When that's the first thing I noticed. Um, well, I, I, the guy right in the middle, he's kind of just hunched over because I have neck and back issues anyway. So I think about that physical problem. And then, of course, the my eyes were also drawn to the picture at the bottom where the guy's playing with his phone while he's driving. So yeah, that. so it's also physical safety, literal physical safety that has been impacted. This video, in fact, if you want to, a family activity. Um, I've included a link to this video. And there are a lot of videos out there like this, but this one really shows that we can, you know, lose touch with our physical surroundings and people yeah. are running into cars and falling into fountains. They call it funny. And I suppose that there's some, some comic relief in watching someone from a distance but it wouldn't be funny if you're the one falling down the stairs right. you know Catherine so, also responded she says that living rooms are designed around a tv set yes yes our physical spaces in fact that was one of the reasons i put these three pictures here is anything can be any space can now be a desk or a you know an office and so the boundaries between home life and work or home life and school you know, here's, here's a mom sitting in the living room trying to do whatever she's doing and momming at the same time. And, and yes, that was, you know, here, his bedroom space is turned into a workspace. And where do you find rest if everything is, you know, a digital space? Any other thoughts? What about these pictures down here in the right corner? What do you see for those who can't see the screen and, and what might that be about? Or this one up here, this is kind of related to. I live right across from the Capitol building and I'm just always, so um, we talk about the dutiful tourists who come and to see the Capitol building and they're taking pictures of it. And you just wonder how much they're experiencing uh, the cherry blossoms or the capital or whatever, because they're so busy taking pictures. Of it. And that's kind of, um, is yes. that now yeah. becoming our experience is um, capturing pictures of our physical space. Exactly. That's the, those were the thoughts that, that I had as I put up these pictures that Mindfulness, this concept that is one of our, um, the things in our, um, ah, the word is not coming to my mind. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's one of the ways that we can defend ourselves against the attention economy is to be mindful. And mindfulness includes being present. And if, if, if we're always seeing the world through our devices, is, are we losing a sense of, of, of that presence and, and connectedness to the moment? Of course, it's wonderful to be able to capture memories, but sometimes we're not necessarily experiencing them if we have, if we're doing everything through the device. Up here in the top corner, um, the UN's really concerned about e-waste too. So there's, there's literal impacts on our environment in the typical way that we think about environment as well. Any other thoughts on this topic before we move ahead? Is there anything in the chat there? Nothing in the chat. Okay, I'll take that as no. Our next topic is to befriend our body's stress response. So before I even go to the, the next slides. When you think about your body's stress response, where do you usually feel stress in your body? How does, what does stress feel like? Or what, what does your body do? How do you know that you're under quote unquote stress? Are you asking for input? Yes, I am. I get a stomach ache. So you feel it in your gut, in your stomach. Yep. Anyone else? Upper back, shoulders. So Jan's back and shoulders. 
I saw Linda's hand go up. Linda, did you want to share? Yes. Um, I can feel it in my chest when I get really anxious. Do you feel like a tightness or? Yeah, a tightness. Yes, I can relate to that. I sometimes actually even physical feel physical pain um, in my chest or stomach. Anyone else? I know if you have, um, oh crap, what's it called? If you have um, immune, autoimmune disorder, if you get stressed, it'll flare up your illness. So it triggers your illness. So right, it can trigger inflammatory responses. As, as an example, many of those, um, those autoimmune diseases are inflammatory in nature, correct? Or whatever the, whatever the, the symptoms may be, right? That's, that is a really good observation. Thank you, Emily. I, I sometimes, oh, go ahead, please. I was going to say, I also think that I get sick easier when I'm really stressed, like with a cold or something, I'll, I'll catch a virus easier. That's probably the immune system. Not The research supports that, that our immune system can be affected. This is all true. Anyone else? Again, we're checking in with our own bodies. How, how does it show up for us? Um, I sometimes scrunch up my forehead even, you know, um, as I was looking for pictures, in fact, to just represent stress, it was interesting how instinctually people's, people's hands go to their eyes, to their head, you know, sometimes to their chest or stomach, but even, even the way we respond to our body shows how and where you can see some of these, these people are very upper body in their head. I included this picture of the girl in this, this young child in yellow because I loved the bright color, but also because you know, she's, she's peeking out a little bit. So instead of completely covering her eyes, like some of the adults are doing in these pictures, she's peeking out a little bit. Say, all right, I'm, I want, I'm gonna look at this. And so that's what we're gonna do. Um, for someone who can see the screen, could I have someone read this quote from Dr. Kelly McGonigal? I can, read it. I can read it. Thanks, Emily. When we change our mindset about stress, even in stressful situations, our bodies can respond in healthy ways. Even at the cardiovascular and chemical level, scientists are discovering more than how we think about stress has a great impact on our health versus just stress itself. In fact, those with a resilient mindset about stress turning the body's stress reaction into a conscious, where is the opportunity here, response can show even greater health markers than those not under similar stress. Thank you. So this TED Talk is amazing. Kelly McGonigal is a stress researcher and she did an about face. I talked a little bit about this before, but she, she did a 180 degree turn on her, her approach to her career. She, her focus was stress can kill you. And then she discovered research that um, reflects what she summarized here. When we think about stress, we often think about the negative impacts of stress and the fight or flight response as though that is all our body can do with stress. But actually there are other chemicals besides just cortisol, for example, that can be released depending on our mindset about stress. So here again, we've got the, the mind-body connection. We're gonna do a little exercise just to reflect some of what she discusses in her book, um, The Upside of Stress. So for those who can't see the screen, Michelle, I have, Michelle, yes ma'am. Before you go on, you, you had two circles in there next to the heart. Do you wanna explain why one is more open and one is- Oh yes, that's talk, that is um, an image representing the, the constriction level or, or the blockage level in blood vessels. So she, she's talking about the physiological changes that can happen depending on how we view stress. So they've done, they've done research on, on the, the, the chemicals released and um, what's happening inside the heart. There's, there's this idea that stress equals heart disease, you know, but she's saying actually the opposite can be true depending on our mindset of, about stress. 
Thank so you one that. of these represents if we have the right mindset, then our um, blood vessels open more. Or they're something? open. Yes, they're they're more open. Oh, I know it's it's incredible. <laughs> it's I it, out of all the research that we've been um, shown and that I've I've gotten into this year in digital wellness. This is probably about my favorite because it has such a potential possible impact. So in this, in this, uh, for if you can't see it, there are two columns. The left column is when your body gives signals like, that's why I invited you to reflect on your own body's stress signals. And I'm even saying quote unquote stress signals because she's even trying to change the, the language around it um, so that we can think about stress with uh, a more flexible mind. Um, the second column is what might a resilient mindset look like in response to what your body's doing. So for example, increased heart rate is another example of something that I experienced. I don't know if others of you share that experience. When you feel your heart rate go up, what, what's, what are the emotions that tend to go with that or the thoughts? Anyone? Any, any nervousness, thoughts? overwhelmed, and 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 this feeling of something's wrong. You know, if I, it, it's this reaction that typically we think fight or flight. You know, it, at, at least for for a lot of people, an increased heart rate means that something's wrong. I need to do something. Some, you know, but her invitation is to turn around and say wow, my body is increasing energy for me to be able to take action in this moment. And that kind of plugs the, the brain back in to say, I'm going to choose what to do with this energy rather than just react. So there's an example. Butterflies in the stomach can say, this is important to me. Whatever's going on right now. In fact, she, we talked in the very first discussion about centering in our values she says that our stress response, our body stress response can help us understand our values. So I'll, I'll give an example. Um, I've dealt with chronic health problems for 18 years. And for the first several years, I just was always so worried about the impact it was having on my parenting. And I, I was, my, my stomach was always tied in knots about it. Now that I look back, I can say, oh, well, my stomach was tight in knots about it because I care about my mothering. I care about being a mom. I care about my kids. If I'd had that tool to reframe those tight stomach, you know, butterfly feelings, it could have had an impact on how I responded to what my body was doing. So if you think about your body's response, any one of the responses that you've talked about, what are some ways that you might be able to play with this? this is, there are no right answers here, but we can, we can learn to re-engage our body's stress responses in different ways and reframe them with, with more of a sense of resilience. Does this trigger any thoughts for any of you as an experiment? Well, the sweaty palms, um... I just remember being young and having to play the piano in front of a group and how it would make me so nervous and my hands would get sweaty. If I were to do that now, maybe I would think, oh, this is wonderful. And my body's warming up my fingers so they'll be mm. flexible and be able to, to do this um, to the best of my ability after I wipe them off. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Your body's sending blood to different parts of your body, warming up your fingers. Yeah. Love that. There's, it's, it's hard to play with cold fingers. So that's, that feels legit. Other ideas. Um, for those who can't see the screen, we have increased heart rate, butterflies, sweaty palms, muscle tightness, tightness, or a, oh, I have closed posture twice. Um, fidgeting, looking down. So when Jan was sharing, it made me think when I had to play the piano, my leg would shake so bad I could hardly <laughs> push the pedal down. I was so nervous. But um, I also get an increased heart rate when I'm getting the feeling I'm supposed to say something maybe in a group of people or in a meeting and mm. it's 
making me a little nervous that I'm supposed to say something. <laughs> Maybe it's just gearing me up to take the pressure. Right. So that, that's a great way to reframe like, thank you, body. Okay. Yeah. This, I have something that I feel is important to say and, and this moment matters. So thanks for giving me the energy to do it. Mm -hmm. That's a good way to think about it. I had a moment last night where I was getting a little bit uptight about an IRS, IRS letter that I got. And, um, I'm trying to think of how I reframed it. It was something like, thank you body for letting me know that, that this is concerning to you. And I was able to talk myself down from, in that case, I, I wanted a little less energy <laughs> directed in that direction, <laughs> but I listened to it. You know, I acknowledged it instead of just sitting in it, it and it worked. It was amazing. <laughs> I think I owe them like 30 cents and they're sending me these. It's, it's just this little thing, but <laughs> okay. But you get the idea. I, this is one of those learn, practice, share activities that when you have the slides, you know, access to the slides, when we can send them out, you could, this could be a fun um, discussion to have with, with a spouse or a friend or with, with older children or a colleague. Um, that is some of what we'll be sending more in our extended version of the slides. There'll be more research around uh, stress and reframing stress. Let's move to the Digital Wellness Institute survey questions. So somebody, was it, I don't have the names in front of me right now. I don't know why my display is a little different this week, but someone even took the survey this week. Thank you for taking the time. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on your experience, but we will be focusing on the physical health. And rather than reading the questions directly today, we're going to go through the questions conceptually, um, and including some research and recommendations. So the first two questions, for those who can see the screen, what are you seeing? People falling asleep, sort of. <laughs> In some cases, yes, and perhaps the flip side in others, yeah? Yeah. The relationship, asleep. yeah, between sleep and our devices. The device in the bed. Okay, so we've got one person who's in the dark, you know, so how close is it to bedtime, sir, you know, for you? <laughs> um, and then many people with their devices in their beds. Uh, so yes, the first two questions in the survey relate to our relationship with sleep and devices. I think this is an important something to note. What's on the screen is a headline that says Netflix is competing against sleep, its CEO says. So when Netflix was asked, when the CEO was asked, who is his greatest competitor? You would think, you know, other tech companies, he said sleep sobering they are deliberately designing their devices to keep our attention even if it interferes with our sleep now obviously other companies are trying to find ways to make sleep better so this is not universal but it does show what it means to live in the attention economy and what we're up against in terms of, of building our own habits and skills and awareness so that they don't win <laughs> They don't win our physical health at our expense. So there are two questions in this part of the survey related to sleep, as I said, um, basically related to these two concepts. What do you do with your devices before bed? And how quickly in the morning do you connect with a device between the time you wake up and, and the time you, know, you first interact with a device? I've also added the concept of, of mere presence and whether that's an issue, um, a lot. I, I would say, Jan, wouldn't you say a good majority of the people in the digital wellness world recommend not having screens in the bedroom at all? Yeah. Um, she and I have had discussions about how that's not always possible. For example, I have a sleep disorder and uh, meditation apps on my devices are one of the things that help me sleep. Um, but I am making changes so that my 
I'm using a phone that doesn't have email and, and text and, you know, my, my apps, my communication apps, so that I'm using it more deliberately just for that. So how, how are you doing? Does anybody want to, to share any of their experiences with devices before bed or as you wake up? True confessional moment. Maybe some of you are not falling into these general statistics that I'm going to cover. I, I can share a little bit. Please. Um, I've started putting my phone in the bathroom, out, away from the bedroom, on the bathroom counter to charge at night. So I'm away from it. And I try not to look at it 30 minutes before bedtime. Sometimes I get a ding and check it. Um, I'm not perfect at it. But the other thing, I've tried to make myself get up and make my bed before I look at my phone. <laughs> so at least that gets done before I start in on messages and to do so even even little things like that can can change up our brain you know because we get into these habits right so that's awesome anyone else okay i'll jump i'll just jump right into the these some of the stats one study showed and there are lots of different studies that have similar trends but 74% of people in this in this study check devices 15 minutes before going to bed. 61% check their phone, their phones. 61% check their phones five minutes upon waking up. 88 within 30 minutes and 96% within an hour. Almost universally within an hour, people are checking their phones. We are, we're so, we're so wedded to them. We also know, or if perhaps you've heard the blue light can impact the body's circadian rhythm and children are more susceptible to this. So I've got a link that you could follow to read more about that. So there's another impact of phones on sleep. So the recommendations are at least 30 minutes. Linda, you nailed it. At least 30 minutes with no tech and upon awakening to do a morning routine first. We'll talk a little bit about this in the productivity section as well, but some people recommend even waiting hours not starting to check things like email till noon. Different people find different rhythms, but that is one of the experts. That's, that's what they've decided to do just to, to, to start their day their way and, and to take control of how their day begins. And with this is just that reminder of the impact of negative news. I mentioned this last week that some research shows that even three minutes of negative news in the morning can have something like a 26, 20, 27% impact more likely or 26, 27% more likely to end the day with, with negative, with kind of a negative mood. So these things can have a real impact. You know, as you're, as you're saying these ideas, I'm thinking one of the reasons I get on my phone I think first thing is to check my calendar. So maybe what mm. I do is look at my calendar the night before and maybe write down on a piece of paper anything I have to remember right when I wake up. Maybe I wouldn't have to check my phone quite so fast. I don't know. That's, that, that's, 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 a great, that's a great idea. I'm sorry. You've got the idea of having a second phone with just your apps on. So did you buy a second phone just for that? I mean, maybe I'm, I'm using, maybe I need a second phone with the calendar. <laughs> I'm using my daughter's phone that she's not using right now. And so it doesn't have a SIM card. Um, so, and it's, you know, I keep the, the phone in the other room and I've actually like last night, I turned the notifications off so that, and, and closed the door in the room that it was in so that I couldn't even hear Mm -hmm. you know, and kept my bedroom door closed. Like, no, nope, that part of my day is done. Um, I have a really hard time turning my brain off. So I like the idea of using paper personally. I think that's a great idea just to have, to shake it up a bit. So it's not, 
Emily if has I could do meditation raised, through paper, I would. Go ahead. Meditation through paper. I'm a big paper person too. I like to take notes on paper. There's something satisfactory about writing it down. Um, Emily had a question. She had her hand up. Emily, did you still have a question? Yes. Um, I was going to say, I've noticed that I have FOMO, the fear of missing out when I'm not with my phone. So one day I fasted from my phone, just try to take a break from it. And then when I got back to it, like at five in the evening, I noticed I missed a meeting and I missed these things that I was supposed to be a part of or do. And then I was like, oh my gosh, I can never do that again. But I think it's hard because maybe I, and I, I could prepare in advance and write it on paper, like you mentioned, but it's hard because it's not just us that's dependent on our phone. Everyone kind of seems to revolve around phones. So it's, you know, when that seems to be like the main method for doing things, it's really hard to break out of it. It is. And it is um, this we'll we'll talk about some of these concepts in the productivity module as well speaking of overlap um that always on culture is real it's this isn't just something we're making up right that that the sometimes things can happen i i, I experience similar things where i feel like i need to check in at least sometimes through the day because of work needs and because of family needs you know, all of my children are now out of the house. They're adults. And this is the way that they, they use these two tools to communicate. So I want to try to find that balance between the mere presence thing and having some distance from my phone. I don't carry it around on me anymore, um, but I do need to check it to, yeah, there, you bring up such a good point. I'm just validating. Yes. Nodding my head. <laughs> so the FOMO wasn't all unfounded. Right. So thank you for sharing your experience. These are, there aren't easy answers here, but we can, we can build awareness and, and, and start to practice different things like simple things like, oh, maybe I'll try paper or maybe I'll, you know, let my colleagues know that I'm available, um, you know, afternoon or whatever. So Great thoughts. The third and fourth question for the survey will relate to overwork and how if we spend too much time on devices um, for long stretches of time and um, the physical impacts of, of overuse. So the first question, do you tend toward long stretches of time or do you take deliberate breaks? So that's a, a thought question to reflect on. And where did, what does your body feel like? Again, this self-awareness of our physical body's responses. Where does your body, wh what does it feel like when you've been on a device for too long? Where in your body do, they, do you feel the impact? Um, and I think, well, I mean, do you notice when you experience overuse, where do you feel it in your body? I feel it in my neck. I do too, neck and shoulders. Has anybody had respect, repetitive stress injuries or strain? I'm I noticed that if I, that don't, if I don't do um, enough wrist exercises that my wrists will ache because of the, the typing. But if I, as long as I, as long as I, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Deliberately combat that especially with yoga and things like that, that I can keep them, at, keep that at bay. So again, that's great awareness and response. You're listening to your body and working with it. It's wonderful. I think the same thing happens with like video games. I've noticed in youth who don't have cell phones, but when they play video games and then when they have to stop, like they're told to stop, then they get like their emotions are out of whack and um, they just seem really irritable and stuff afterward. That I, I have, uh, yes. When I was a child long before, long before, you know, it was Atari back then, but I could remember that feeling of sort of getting lost and then having to almost kind of shake your head back in. I mean, have you ever experienced that in movie theater where you're so engrossed in the experience that you come out and you I, I can sometimes come out a little bit wobbly as I come back out into the light and, oh yeah, okay. There's this real world out here. I have to readjust. 
Um, okay, so recommendations regarding overwork and physical strain. Thank you for your input, Emily. Um, 90 minutes is what they found, 60 to 90 minutes that, that we, we start to, our, our energy and productivity starts to degrade around 90 minutes. So you, you may not be one on devices a lot, but perhaps your children doing homework or if they're doing homeschool or if they're doing you know, this, this, a lot of this course from the Digital Wellness Institute was created during the pandemic and trying to address this sudden change in everyone's lives where, you know, working from home and school from home. Um, so this could also be relevant for, for kids in schooling. The recommendation is to take breaks of five to 15 minutes every 60 to 90 minutes, or at least 30 to 60 seconds every 30 minutes. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in the productivity section as well. I heard this, I told, I just mentioned last week that I'm taking a brain plasticity course from James Garrett. And um, he made this simple recommendation to build in breaks, just drink more water. Again, work with your body. Our bodies are actually really smart. And if we work with them and you know they need more water than we often give them or often need more water and we can just have breaks built in if we do that so there's a little tip for the day i won't be going through this tech tech tension release meditation but the ceo of digital wellness institute is a uh, therapist a social worker and she has a lovely tech tension meditation that goes through different parts of the body that tend to get overworked. So I've left that as a resource. And there are also many stretches and other things that you can find online for different parts of the body. And you know, we often talk about the upper body, but um, the physical therapist who, who uh, taught us in the digital wellness course talked about the, the lower body as well, because we're sitting for a long time and that can impact our hips and our legs and, and, our whole body ends up being involved, even though it doesn't feel that way. <laughs> it's just um, sitting, you know, Michelle, um, yes. I mentioned last week that I, that I practice yoga and I've heard a friend of mine that I I've attended a lot of her classes. She said that they say that sitting is the new smoking. And what it does is it, mm. it, it, allow, it, it doesn't allow for you to stretch out the front of your hips, which does cause hip pain, lower back pain, all kinds of things. So yeah, you have to, you have to counteract that. Um, I know there's different chairs and things that are supposed to make it better, but I just try and spend some time sitting with my legs crossed on the floor instead of in a chair. And that's a great example of, of, um, you know, sitting on the floor. If I were to put up a picture of sitting on the floor, we, we'd perhaps say, oh, that's not the best posture, but it could be doing something really important to shift up how you're sitting. Definitely. Sounds like we need to have you do a class. <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> All right. For time's sake, I'm going to keep moving. The discussion is so great. I, I love hearing your thoughts. And um, the last question on the survey is about screen free eating. So when we're talking about family settings, um, you've just, I just saw a post uh, for, from Cheryl Lee about how prevention science, if there's one common thread throughout prevention science, it's Meal time, meal time, meal time, family meal time is a protective factor for so many different things. So I imagine this is something that's already on your mind. So my comment here is more about your own personal, you know, you're grabbing a snack or maybe your kids are at school and you're doing lunch alone. How often do you practice screen-free eating? So there's a, a, food, a food for thought question. Um, the recommendation is at least one, one screen free, screen free meal a day. I'm currently living, living alone. Like I said, my, my kids are up and grown and this is been, this has been one of the, the, uh, the challenges that I have taken that has had the biggest impact on me. Um, I love to learn. I tend to be a multitasker. We'll talk a little bit more about that next week. We've already talked about it. We'll talk about it more next week, but, I decided I'm, um, I'm, I was going to try to break this, this rhythm. And it was hard because I'm used to reading while I'm eating. I'm used to 
a little bit of that FOMO, Emily, that you talked about, um, I think is part of that. So at first I just set a timer for 10 minutes, at least for one meal. And now it's every meal. I just don't have tech as a general rule. And it has made, it has made a huge difference in the pace of my life and the feeling of more peace. It's like I can feel my brain, the brain chemicals just kind of bathing me. Someone in, in uh, the course that I'm taking um, talked about single tasking and, and making some changes like that. As she says, this may sound weird, but it's kind of like walking in the forest. So if you do have opportunities to practice this, I would highly recommend it. Okay, we like to build in a blink and breathe break. And today we're gonna do that by following what's called the 20-20-20 rule. I actually have my phone in another room. So does someone have a timer handy where they could set a 20 second timer for us? I can do that. Thanks, Megan. So for 20 seconds, I'll, I'll say go, um, or you say go when we to start us off. And the idea is just look up from your screen, look out 20 feet or so, and just do that for 20 seconds. So okay, if ready? Any, yep. Three, two, one, go. Sometimes I like to just be conscious of my blinking when I do this. can hold a good long couple of breaths in there as well. That's it. Kind of feels like a long time when you're in the middle of something, doesn't it? <laughs> and then all of a sudden it's over. <laughs> they recommend doing this every 20 minutes. So, you know, if you're on a Zoom call, you can look just above your computer without anybody knowing that that's what you're doing. <laughs> but you can give your eyes a break from staring because we blink less and it does create eye strain. And we actually breathe less when we're on technology. So for time's sake, I won't um, review the details of the eye strain recommendations, but will mention that some have noted that we do change our breath when we're on technology. So taking a blink, a 20, 20, 20 break can also be good to kind of re-engage. Oh yeah, I need to breathe. Um, they did find that in this particular study that dancers, musicians, highly trained athletes, and test pilots didn't exhibit tech apnea. And they, they posit that this is because they'd already been taught breathing techniques to man manage emotions and energy. They built the body memory to breathe more. So that to me suggests that we can, we can learn and build in these practices so that our physical body uh, remembers it to do it itself more often. Okay, ergonomics issues. What do you see? For those who can see the screen, what are some examples of things you're seeing? We're almost done here. Some people are hunched over their computers. The girl in red is kind of twisting her body. Oh, I have done that way too many times. <laughs> the girl in the bottom right corner has to like kink her neck pretty far to see down. Yes. Somebody asked about this one in the middle, the, the guy with the ponytail. It's pretty subtle, but what's, what's going on with him? Looks like he's kind of leaning on one hip to me. Yep. So, so if you look, if you look at his spine, his shoulders, you know, one's tipped down, he's leaned over and his arm is not in neutral. So if you look at the ergonomics here, do you see how the, the arm should be in, in a more neutral position so that it's not straining? Because if your arms are reaching out, you're straining arms and shoulders and neck and back and hips, and it goes all the way through the body. So ergonomics is so hard for me. I get really lazy really easily. So I don't know if anybody else struggles with that as well, but you'll have these slides too. And there's a link here for detailed workstation ideas for better ergonomics. All right, so as we close, um, 
for time's sake, I'm just going to turn this into a self-reflection, but how are you doing? What are you doing well? Where are your weak spots? Is there something that's come to mind through the discussion that, that said, yeah, I, I think I want to try that this week. Our invitations are, if you haven't, take the, the digital wellness survey. We'll, we'll extend that invitation every week, not only because of the baseline, but because to have a baseline so that by the end of the series, you can compare. And also because the questions are very educational. There's a lot of learning that can be done simply by reading the questions and engaging with them. I invite you to review today's slides for one physical wellness activity that you want to try and one, one concept that you'd like to share with someone else. Um, you know the quotes that we like to share, so I won't go through them, but we'll just call to mind Victor Frank Frankel and Gandhi, and I will use this one in the attention economy. As I said before, mindfulness is activism. Our awareness is a way for us to reclaim our lives. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for your thoughts and participation and engagement. Oh, I'm looking at the chat now, migraines. Oh, Catherine, <laughs> I can empathize with this. I'm just gonna go through Thank you for Jan providing link to the survey. So there's a link to the survey in the chat and it will also come in the notes afterwards. Um, Catherine talks about migraines. Emily says, I used to think I handled stress really well because I never recognized having stress. You have RA, so you were speaking from, from experience with joint discomfort and pain when you overdo. Thanks for being willing to share your experience with that. I'm sorry you did with RA, that's rough. Any parting thoughts, Megan, or anyone else? I was just going to ask if anyone else had any comments or questions before we end today's discussion. Going, going. <laughs> there was a lot of great discussion through. So. Yes. Yes, there was. Thanks for your participation, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us with Parent Conversations. Um, again, it's I always have to say thank you to the, the grants that make it possible. Bear River Health Department, Central Utah Public Health Department, and Davis County Health Department. Um, join us next Tuesday uh, again at 1 o'clock, and we'll, um, we'll talk about the next segment in the same series, and I'm gonna pull up the name real quick. It's Honoring Our Time. Ooh, that's a really good one, especially for those of us that seem to be working like 24 <laughs> seven. There's always so much to do. There, there's always so much to do. I, I could be working 24 seven if I allowed myself, so. Um, thanks, and we'll go ahead and end the session unless anybody else has anything to add. Catch us on the replay. Thanks everybody. Thank you.